today I'm going to be talking about uh, a little bit about specs. So this talk is called Join Us, or How I Stop Worrying and Learn to Love Traits. So keeping on with the theme of traits. So this is a Specs RS retrospective. I did a lot of work in the initial bring up of Specs. So this is some of the neat things we worked on and implemented inside of that. And I wanted to share it with you. So before we start off, does anyone know what an ECS is here? Got a few. Uh, second question. Um, how many people are really proficient with Rust? Have you like done macros and stuff like that? How many people have never used Rust at all? All right, you people, tell me when I get lose you, okay? Because this is this this goes right into the weeds of Rust, okay? Um, just a heads up, all right? So an ECS is an entity component system, and what an entity component system does is it kind of works like a column-based database. You have entities, so we've got three entities here, and these are literally just an index. Um, in the case of specs, some entity component systems do more sophisticated work than this. They'll like use a pointer here, but specs just use this as an index. It has a little bit of generation inf information, and that's just used to make sure that we don't accidentally reuse things. And now we have to add a component. So we add a positions component. And now we need to bind some values to some of these entities. So we add these two position vectors to it. Um, now, it's important to note that no values are actually very important in the design of an ECS because most entities do not have all their components bound. Um, and that's very valid because how systems will work in an entity component system is they will run through components that have common pieces and they'll want to skip over pieces that are missing. So if you, for example, have a velocity and a position and you want to move these things, you only want to look for components to share those two things. Or if you want to you know, track lifetime and your HP, you only want to care about units that have that. So an important part of an ECS is how data is stored and how it is arranged in memory. So typically speaking, we have a dense storage table. So we have some occupied slots per entity per index. And we have some wasted or unused slots. And this is just used because when we're doing a dense thing, it's basically implemented as a vector. And the reason is because that's just simple pointer math to get to your index. It's just an addition, maybe multiplication or a bit shift, and you get to the value you're looking for when you're doing the index lookup very quickly. It also keeps similar values close together all in memory. Close to get, uh, it keeps the values close together in memory, which allows for the cache lookups to be more efficient, basically. Um, not everything is chosen to do these kind of dense styles. The other style is kind of a sparse, which despite it is actually more densely packed in memory, but the key space is not as dense. So typically you would do this with a hash map or a radix tree or a B tree. So these trade off something. They're, they're trading off um, being more efficient in space for giving much slower uh, access time. So like a hash map compared to a vector is like orders of magnitude slower. Um, or B trees and stuff are complexity order, um, like log n log n, sorry, log n complexity. So much slower to access. So there's no best choice. It really depends on your application. And you'll find that sometimes you'll move around these types for performance tuning later on your thing. So Inside of specs, this is what a component trait looks like. So it's pretty simple. Uh, we have this thing called an associated type, which we did not go over, but does, how many people know what this is? About half of you? OK. So what an associated type is, is it's a value that's bound to, to a trait, basically. So it says, when you're using this trait, this value will kind of get found here. So this trait literally has no methods in it. All it has is this associated type. So that when we bind it to a specific type later, we know that this type is associated with it. And hence, it's an associated type. 
So in this, we have just one thing, which is the storage type, which contains the type itself. I'm going to say type a lot, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so the advantage of this is the type is always known at compile time of what's associated with it. So the example before with the earlier presentation with the loggers, et cetera, this basically goes one layer of detail, like is a bit different, right? Every single time you say it, like you see a uint, you know it's always going to be stored in this type of vector, or your velocity vector will always be stored in like a dense or a sparse or a hash map, etc. So you always know about that. Now we could go without this, and there's actually many ECSs written Rust, Lua, etc. that do do this. And and why did we choose not to do this? Well, the answer is like we had said before. We need to do this, which is basically boxing our position table, um, which creates a trade object. And then we lose the ability to inline things, and we lose the ability to build specific functions. And that's really important later, because there is a whole mix of things that will happen that basically function calling overhead will be the entire sum of our program. <laughs> it's quite annoying. So we skip over that, and we just Static types all the way through. So the compiler knows everything. So registering a type is pretty simple, since like this position vector, we've told it it has a ve uh, vec storage, um, which is a type of dense storage, like I said. And then we ins um, install it using this. If you don't know, by the way, this is called a TurboFish operator, um, which I really love the name of. Um, so this basically says, this position is now getting registered. And now we know that it's being registered and we know the type because we can look up through this trait what the type should have been and then just use the default implementation of it. So the nice advantage of this is that the compiler, when we, when we access it later, the compiler will always associate the type back. So when we ask for positions, it can look up this trait and then know that it's going to be a vector storage in whatever function we grab data out of the component system later. So there's zero interface overhead when we actually have to use it. And this will be a big part for when we get into systems, which is now. All right. So systems are the last bit of the entity component system. Um, it's basically what does actual work to progress your uh, the state of the program. So this is what a system, a simple system looks like in a, in specs, so you have a few resources that you're being that are being read in. So we got a read-only resource here. We got a read-write resource, um, and these are accessed as a tuple, typically. Um, there is other ways to do this, um, which I'll get to later. The advantage of using it as a tuple is you can just keep attacking on the types that you're interested in when you're working on your system. So, and then obviously the run function, which is where actually you do the work. So how does this all work? How do we go from having this type with a list of tuples into actually getting like the parameters in? And that's because the system data implements the system data trait. Pretty simple. And it's a pretty simple trait. It only does really one thing. Um, it fetches itself out of a resource map. So a resource map is just internal to the engine. It's basically a table of all of the uh, components that you've ever registered. And now you're pulling out the t uh, each individual table from the column. And then you just return yourself. So in Rust, there's actually no nice way to like, do a tuple implementation, but there is a really ugly way, and that's exactly what we do here. You'll see this a lot. <laughs> um, so this is um, basically we've gone through and done the first 26 tuples. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it's really ugly. <laughs> um, Internally, this is actually not that complicated. We're just going through and doing the same thing. It's just doing a fetch, a fetch, a fetch. Um, 
So the parameter list gets expanded. And um, each parameter does a fetch. And it's always in the same order. So we're just fetching each thing out of it. That's pretty straightforward. But it's pretty incomprehensible. Um, the macro system in Rust is known to be pretty much the ugliest thing in the world. Um, it's best to avoid it, but there's these certain circumstances where it's just so much nicer. Um, for the record, all of this ugliness, like um, this, is not exposed to the user. It's just hidden in the bowels of the uh, entity opponent system. All right. Um, so now we'll get to the join trait. And the join trait's where things actually start to get super interesting. So this is, once again, a more expanded system. We've, we're getting a rate storage of positions and a, re, um, and a read storage of velocities. And we're going to act on them. So the key way we act on this is through this little method called join. And what that will do is it will iterate over all of the components that match the pattern. So everything that's a position has a position and has a velocity will get returned, and then we can act on them as a nice little for loop. Um, and this is done through the join trait, um, and it takes another tuple. So we're going to see some of that ug ugliness again. And it obviously returns a tuple of the same kind of shape. So if you've got position vector, you get a position vector out. Um, if you pass in a mutable reference, you get a mutable reference out, for example, of the internal value. If you can, like if you, you need right access to that, obviously, before you can do that. But it, it's pretty intuitive how to use this. But how it's actually implemented is far from intuitive. So this is the trait. Um, the actual user-facing part is just the join method. Everything else is pretty much internal to the engine itself. Um, so each row that is fetched is done through this unsafe function. And it's unsafe basically for performance optimizations reasons. It returns a non-optional value, which, like if you're going through a hash map, for example, is not legal. So we basically assume that the mask has done its job. Um, I'm going to get into what this mask does. Well, the mask is used basically to determine if there's an occupation of, in like the table of that. So this is pretty straightforward. Um, I've got two compo theoretical components here, right? The blue and the uh, reddish pink one, All right? And if we add them together, we get out a new, um, a new kind of pseudo column, and that's what's common between the two. And what's nice about this is it creates large gaps. So if we were to run through, say, the smallest column, go through each key, and then check every other column to make sure they match. That's pretty slow, because you're doing a lookup on every single column. By doing this, we just take the masks all at once, and we do the math on the ma masks, which is very simple. It's just bit operations. And then it spits out which things are common. So obviously, this is going to get ugly. So we go back to another one of these wonderful, ugly things where we've gone through and done a large array for tuples. So you've seen this before, but it's still ugly. Um, internally, this is doing another macro expansion. Um, so this is the return type that we're getting out of everything, um, which, if you go back here, is the type right here. So that's this. Pretty straightforward. Um, this is the internal type used in it, the, basically the array of tables. It's not very well named. Um, and in hindsight, I probably should have renamed this one. And then finally, the mask. And what is this bit and thing? And this is where things kind of get weird. Bit and is this uh, operator, basically another trait. Um, and it has an and function on it. And once again, this works on tuples. So we have another ugly table like this. Um, so internally, this looks like this. Um, this is, by the way, the entire expansion of the macro thing. So we kind of got a, a left or right, and then an and function. So this is actually a recursive trait. And this is where things get super cool. 
Um, and there's this little function called split. Um, this is taken out of another library called tuple utils, which I also wrote. Um, basically, this will take a tuple and it will try to split it more or less in half. Um, the left tends to grab the extra value if it's an odd number. So it has this nice little trait, grab the left, grab the right. Uh, internally, once again, this is completely ugly in the library. We have a bunch of tables where we just go through and manually done this. I think I wrote this with the Python script like five years ago. Um, but the effect of it is pretty useful because when we go back to here, we kind of get this recursive and, and we get this recursive value, which means that um, getting into something pretty neat. And then we have this one special case, since we're going to do obviously recursion for handling the last case, which is just the and, and we just return the last value. So what this is doing is the join trait is calling the bit and, which splits it, and the values get put into bit and, and that keeps going down and it, kind of around in a circle um, until you hit the last bit. So you get this nice little tree internally built up um, in it. Um, so the purpose of all of that basically is to get all the way back here is that we've built this nice type tree, we've built this nice and statement, et cetera, and now it all gets inlined here. So all of those tuples being wrapped and unwrapped, et cetera, all comes back to the statement where we're basically saying, split these up, do an and operation on these masks, find all the masks that are common, and then return them as an iterator. So it looks very simple for the user. And as my quick explanation through all the traits says, it, it's far from that simple. Um, so yeah, um, why did we do this? It allows for very flexible types. So when you go back to the components, right? Um, when you go back here, the write storage, the read storage, you're only acting on the position or the vector. You're asking for what you want you don't have to have any knowledge of what's happening internally, right? You can just redefine it where the component was defined, where, how you want it stored. Um, so that gives you very flexible types. They're always going to be defined in one place. Um, and it gives the compiler a lot of information that it can be used for specialization, which provides quite a bit of performance advantage. Um, and to user, it's a very, very simple looking API. And it's very fast. In fact, w these are kind of the latest numbers. Um, when Specs came out, by the way, it was super fast compared to everything else. Um, ECS is one of the older, like probably one of the first entity component systems in Rust. And Rust was, uh, Specs was two or three times faster. And it's kept that lead for a while. Um, some of the new ones have popped up. Some of them are actually derived on this, the code base, like um, all the um, bit sets and et cetera were all used in Constellation. And in fact, they got merged into a library. So um, yeah, so this is a super fast, super flexible little library. And those slides took a lot faster than I thought. So any questions or? Do you know what the last table of time? Sorry? Uh, you show those two tables where you were showing uh, relative time for different libraries. Graphs. Two oh, graphs, yeah. Ah. Sure. The one. Yep. What, what does it mean by the update? Is that like how long it takes to update a certain item in the ECS? Yeah, to iterate through the entire table and update each. Um, well, update the entire table. Yeah. Any other? Does this make compile time slow? Does this make compile time slow? And the answer is, it's amazingly slow. <laughs> um, it produces a lot of traits, and so it has to look through them. All. But yeah, it's very slow, unfortunately. That's the big trade-off you have with doing these kind of optimizations. Another question? Follow-up question. Uh, is it slow on the initial build of the library when it downloads it and builds it from Cargo, or is it also slow when you build your uh, project that depends on it? It's mostly the dependent project that slows down. Um, smaller ones are obviously still pretty quick, 
but as a project breaks up, you're going to look for ways to start segmenting things into different compilation units. So, any more questions? Cool. Well, I'll be around if you want. Have any other questions?